During a recent discussion, Joe Rogan passionately expressed his deep concerns about the ongoing prosecution of Donald Trump, fearing it sets a perilous precedent for American democracy. Rogan vividly painted a picture of the potential long-term consequences, warning that this shift could thrust us into a situation akin to Mexico, where political candidates are relentlessly targeted and silenced. He fervently stressed that the actions taken against Trump could ultimately backfire on future administrations, igniting a wave of political instability and chaos. Don't miss, what are the potential consequences of prosecuting political figures according to Joe Rogan? How do Joe Rogan and Tony Hinchcliffe describe the current state of USC? Politics. Why does Joe Rogan compare the U.S. political situation to a third world country or a banana republic? He's so chaotic. Absolutely. We got no border. We got no border. Worries about national security and immigration policies ignite a deep sense of urgency. It stirs empathy among those who passionately believe that a robust border is crucial for preserving our nation's sovereignty and safety. We're giving money to fucking whoever wants it. We're already rich countries. We got men who are the first female admiral. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We have so much chaos. We have so much chaos. The public is painfully aware of the chaos stemming from poor management and weak leadership. There's an urgent yearning for stability and strong, effective governance. Chaos. It's so kooky. It's so cookie. The word cookie captures the sheer absurdity and irrationality of what's happening right now. People see it as a sharp critique of policies and societal shifts that appear to blatantly disregard common sense and core values. Yeah. It's just so kooky. It's and it, crazy. It's kooky and it, it seems like they're just leaning into it. Like there's no course correction at all. Just leaning into the kooky. Yeah. Fun times. Oh, yeah. For comedy. Oh, my goodness. We have so much stuff to talk about, stuff that you would have to manufacture something that bizarre that people are accepting at any other time in history. It's, it's so weird. It's so weird. It really is like the whole country's hypnotized. It really is like the whole country's hypnotized. It's heartbreaking to see so many people swept away by misguided leaders and harmful ideologies. The cloud of public sympathy seems to have dimmed the light of rational thinking and the power of independent judgment. And I just think this is a perfect storm of things that are happening all at the same time. With AI emerging, China and Russia becoming buddies, us being run by a dead man, they're trying to stop this other guy from even running and they're exposing how corrupt the democracy is. They're exposing how corrupt the democracy is. The conviction that today's events expose deep-rooted corruption. People witness this as a glaring indication of worries about the honesty and openness of governmental bodies. They're exposing how corrupt the system is. Just by charging this guy with 34 felonies for paying off a, a lady he had sex with. Like, what? And how else would he have paid her money to... Well, it was the way it was written. The way it was put in a ledger it's basically on most situations it would have been considered a misdemeanor but they they turned it into a felony they trumped it up and they trumped it up all yeah. no pun intended yeah. and then they uh he signed like 34 different checks so there's 34 different <laughs> the whole thing's crazy first of all what a cheap fuck a pair of installments <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't give her all the money <laughs> give her a little taste keep her on the hook yeah that actually makes sense, I guess, now that I think about it. Because if you pay her all at once, she could just write a book or whatever. No, the whole deal was that she couldn't talk if she got the money, but obviously that didn't work out. Right. She got the money and still talked. Like, <laughs> if you have the backing of the political party, it doesn't matter. Like, especially the party that's in charge. The, but what's scary is how many Democrats are willing to allow this kind of stuff to happen. But a lot of them are aware of it. There was this one lady that went viral. And she was talking about it and she was saying, you have to understand, like, I'm not a Trump supporter. I don't like Trump. But this is really dangerous for democracy. But this is really dangerous for democracy. There are growing anxieties that current measures are eroding the bedrock of democratic values and the integrity of the legal system. Deep-seated conservative worries about the lasting repercussions on the fabric of American democracy are mounting. Nobody can justify this. And nobody can say this guy should be in jail for this. This doesn't make any sense. And especially if you wanted to look at past presidents with the same scrutiny, I mean, there's 
there's so many instances of things that you could go. And this was one of the things that Obama had said when Obama got into office. They were talking about George Bush and Dick Cheney being charged with war crimes. And he was saying, we're not going to look to the past. We're going to look towards the future. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we're not going to prosecute anybody. You imagine if, if when Obama got into office, if he decided to prosecute Dick Cheney and George Bush for crimes against humanity? Imagine if, when Obama got into office, he decided to prosecute Dick Cheney and George Bush for crimes against humanity. This imagined situation highlights the peril of turning justice into a political weapon and the dangerous precedents it can establish. The public perceives this as a stark warning against twisting the legal system for political vengeance. Yeah, crazy. Oh my God. Can you, you know how crazy that would be? Do you know how divided the country would be then? Do you know how divided the country would be then? There is a growing unease about the widening rift in our nation. This sentiment echoes the conservative yearning for unity and stability amidst our political divides. Yet, these efforts might, ironically, fuel the very polarization they seek to quell. Well, that's the same thing, kind of, that is taking place now, at a lesser scale, obviously, because it's not a war crime you're charging someone with, but you could. You could charge Trump with war crimes. You could find some things that he did, especially with bombings and, you know, and even with, with Obama did. Obama, during the administration, they dropped the drone on a U.S. citizen. No trial, no nothing. Boom. Yeah. Trump didn't even go for, he didn't go for Obama. He didn't go for Hillary. Trump didn't even go for, he didn't go for Obama. He didn't go for Hillary. When people see moderation and impartiality, they take it as a powerful testament that Donald Trump did not misuse his authority for political retaliation. It's seen as a sign of true integrity, free from the desire for partisan vengeance. You know, and he could have. He could have tried them for things. Yeah. Well, especially Hillary. Yeah. Especially with the whole email thing and the deleting of the email. And supposedly Trump's the crazy one. Trump's the loose cannon. Supposedly Trump's the crazy one. Trump's the loose cannon. Amidst the swirling storm of political chaos, Donald Trump stands firm against accusations of irrationality. Despite fierce criticism branding his actions as erratic, he argues that his behavior is a beacon of stability in an otherwise tumultuous landscape. They're all crazy. That's what they don't want you to know. They're all crazy. That's what they don't want you to know. A deep-seated conviction has taken root that the political elite are corrupt and irrational. This widespread sentiment has led the public to conclude that it's not merely a matter of one party's failings, but rather an indictment of the entire political system as fundamentally broken and deceitful. It's like sluts that are always t talking bad about other girls who are sluts. <laughs> like, you know... So what people do, it's a, it's a thing that, you know, people, oh, that's not me. I'm not like that. It's just a weird thing that people do and people form teams. It's just a weird thing that people do and people form teams. Humans have an inherent inclination to form factions and fall into tribalism. It's disheartening, yet there's a public understanding that political polarization is an inevitable, though regrettable, facet of our nature. And they justify why they should use any means necessary to silence the other people on the other team, the opposition, and they don't even realize they're setting a precedent when this motherfucker gets in office or another motherfucker gets in office that's a Republican. You've got real problems now, kids. You've got real problems now, kids. Beware of the grave repercussions tied to the current political approach. This is a fervent plea to acknowledge and confront the profound issues born from relentless partisan clashes and pervasive corruption. If the elections are real, that's how it usually goes. It usually goes one side wins and like, this fucking sucks. Let's try the other way. The other guy wins like, oh, this is bullshit. Let's try the other way. And this is what we've done in this country over and over and over again. This is what we've done in this country over and over and over again. The endless cycle of history's repetition breeds a deep sense of frustration. It's a stark critique of the ceaseless tug of war for political power, highlighting the painful lack of real, transformative change. Yeah. You know, we go Clinton to Bush, Bush to Obama. It's what we do. Yeah. It's what we do. Yeah. We always do it this way. Yep. And if you change the way people are allowed to go after political candidates, and you change the way you're allowed to silence and, 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 and imprison your candidates, then we're like Mexico. We're just not assassinating people yet. We're just not assassinating people yet. Amidst the intensifying political turmoil, the U.S. teeters on the brink of extreme actions reminiscent of less stable nations.
This stirs a deep-seated fear among conservatives, who dread an impending surge of violence and a descent into lawlessness. You know, we're like a third world country. We're like a banana republic. We're, yeah. we're like a third world country. We're like a banana republic. There is a profound and growing worry about the crumbling of democratic values and the undermining of the rule of law. Many people might see this as a shocking sign that the United States is drifting away from its reputation as a stable and leading nation. <sighs> We're letting things other than the will of the people and what's best for the people be what's, what's running the thing. We're letting things other than the will of the people and what's best for the people be what's running the thing. It's a glaring sign that democracy is being sabotaged by self-serving interests and corrupt officials. We must reclaim our power, ensuring that the government truly acts in the best interest of the people. We're letting the thing be run by the people that are in power, that are corrupt, that want to keep the power. We're letting the thing be run by the people that are in power, that are corrupt, that want to keep the power. Public sentiment is steeped in a profound distrust of institutional corruption. Instead of prioritizing the common good, those wielding power seem driven by sheer self-interest and an insatiable thirst to cling to their positions. Because it's not just Biden. Biden is barely there, right? It's all the people that are working there. Because it's not just Biden. Biden is barely there, right? It's all the people that are working there. Imagine the current administration as a stage play, with Joe Biden merely a puppet on display. It's a harsh critique, pointing fingers at the faceless bureaucrats and shadowy officials pulling the strings from behind the curtain, wielding the real power with an iron fist. You gotta understand, he's this huge team behind him. They don't want to leave. What? Get on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn, and fucking try to get a new job. Start sending out your resume. Yeah. I work for the worst administration ever. <laughs> right. In a riveting podcast episode, Joe Rogan and comedian Tony Hinchcliffe delve deep into the turbulent political waters stirred by the legal actions against former President Donald Trump. Rogan's voice brimmed with concern as he contemplated the profound long-term repercussions of these prosecutions. He argued passionately that they set a perilous precedent for future political hopefuls and leaders, casting a long shadow over the landscape of American politics. Rogan didn't hold back, highlighting the glaring inconsistencies in the treatment of political figures. He pointed to past presidents like Obama, who authorized a drone strike on a U.S. citizen without facing any legal consequences. The hypocrisy, he argued, was stark and unsettling. If the same rigorous scrutiny were applied uniformly, Many former leaders might find themselves in the dock. Yet it seemed to him that Trump was being singled out selectively, and this selective justice, he suggested, exposed a deeper rot within the system. The conversation veered into the chaotic state of current U.S. politics with Rogan painting a picture of a nation teetering on the edge of sanity. He described the scene as kooky, devoid of any semblance of course correction. The podcast echoed a chilling warning, Political actions driven by partisan agendas threaten to erode the very foundations of democracy, risking a descent into a banana republic scenario where political adversaries are silenced or imprisoned. Rogan's words were a stark reminder of the system's corruption laid bare by the prosecutions against Trump. He argued that these actions revealed not just flaws, but festering wounds within the political and legal frameworks. He issued a grave warning. Such dangerous precedents could boomerang disastrously when political fortunes shift, deepening divisions and sowing instability across the nation. Consider the profound moral and ethical ramifications of prosecuting a former president. The ethical quandaries of using legal channels to silence political adversaries and the potential long-term impacts on democracy are immense. Engaging in discussions about these actions suggests a risk of inciting cycles of retaliation potentially undermining the moral foundation of our political system. Joe Rogan's apprehensions regarding the precedent set by the indictment of Donald Trump resonate with broader concerns about individual freedoms and the integrity of the political process, as well as the genuine expression of personal responsibility, beliefs, and actions. Rogan's critique of the current political landscape underscores the necessity for stability and adherence to existing laws. His analogy between Mexico and a banana republic sparks fear that the United States could erode its democratic principles by permitting political prosecutions. This touches on conservative values and the empathetic need to uphold order and a fundamental legal structure.
but the group dynamics and polarization exposed in Rogan's discourse reveal how political factions justify actions against opponents, the psychological mechanisms fueling such division, and the rationale behind extreme meters against perceived threat. Moreover, Rogan highlights the significant influence of media and public perception on political ideologies and actions. His commentary on how political news shapes public opinion and affects international actors like China and Russia underscores the media's pivotal role in crafting and reinforcing political narratives. On an individual level, there is an imperative to navigate these narratives critically and develop genuine beliefs. What do you think?